Hello, uh, everyone, and welcome to the fifth session of the HPPT and Slides. Um, this is a mini seminar series uh, intended for early career researchers within the HPP to present their research. Uh, we're going to have two talks uh, each 10 minutes, followed by, after each talk, we're going to have a mini Q&A session. Um, after both of the talks, we're going to have an extra Q&A session for the remainder of the time where you can ask either of the participants questions. Um, in this session, we have Robin and Maria Luisa uh, going to pre be presenting their topic, uh, the, presenting their work on the topic of the neuron simulator and two-photo microscopy. Um, we also have some additional housekeeping uh, to do real quick. Um, so if someone experiences technical issues like I have that can't be that uh, as opposed to my issues that can be solved during the session, please contact the education team uh, um, with, uh, on their email address, education at humanverproject.eu, so they can fix the problem in a future session. Um, this session will be recorded and will be made available in the HPP Education Program's e-library um, and on YouTube um, a few days after the event. Participants? Please ask your questions in the Q&A chat uh, on the right um, with the setting visible for all panelists so that someone can pick up the question and I'll be able to see it and ask the panelists the question. Alternatively, if you'd rather have a more personal experience and you feel the question isn't um, well suited for writing, you can also raise your hand and we'll unmute you so you can ask the question personally. Um, if we don't get around to answering all of the questions or if there's further discussion to be had after the session, it can be continued on the HVP students Slack channel, um, which is going to be advertised in the slides that you're seeing in front of you right now. Um, of course, feel, please feel free to email the presenters if you have any additional questions or comments. So with the admin out of the way, I hope everybody's ready with their beverage of choice to offer your full attention to Robin and Maria Luisa for their talks. So uh, today I'm stretching the brand image a bit um, by having some uh, kombucha um, instead of some instead of a, a warm drink. So Robin, could you please step up to the podium and take the floor? Hi, um, so I'm Robin de Schepper and I work at the University of Pavia and I created some tools for um, working in neuron. Okay. And the uh, focus of the tool is quality of life, which means improvements that just make it a bit more enjoyable to work with the neuron Python interface. While working with it, I um, noticed some weak points namely that it's a thin wrapper into a C and a hoc environment. So while it feels like you're programming in Python, you're actually quite quickly under the hood, uh, relying on a lot of C mechanisms, which also means that while you're programming in Python, you're exposed to some of the unmanaged parts of the C language, like reference errors or segmentation faults. And in general, because it's a quite old language, it's not a very expressive or convenient API. And when you get started, there are many peculiar need to know things that you have to um, arrange or things that should kind of work, don't work um, very naturally. Here's a quick example of, of this in action. Well, where on the left I've marked in red some elements that I don't think are very necessary in a Python environment. For example, when you access a section, you always have to specify which segment um the underscore ref underscore something syntax isn't very neat sometimes you have to pass section keyword arguments i'm not sure how familiar everybody here is with uh, neuron but on the right you can see what i think is um, a cleaner syntax for for working with neuron so i try to make tools that provide these quality of life improvements so that they can flatten the learning curve for new people so that they can provide same defaults so that things kind of work out of the box, so that background clutter, things you shouldn't really be worried about when expressing what your code wants to do is hidden, 
and you in general as a programmer create more expressive code which means that when you read code it's more apparent what the code is supposed to be the first tool i'd like to rep to present is a um, patch it's a drop-in replacement of neuron's python module which means that if you have any neuron code you can quite easily uh, switch to patch uh, as you can see in this gif um, by um, substituting the um, hoc interpreter by patches hoc interpreter which will already fix many common bugs and will allow you to use its um, expressive um, convenience layer mm, i'm going to skip this one and i'm just going to show you what patch can do in terms of convenience on the left you have the setup for parallel simulations in uh, neuron and on the right, you have the same parallel setup in uh, patch. On the right, I try to organize it in such a way that you have like a clear transmitter and receiver uh, pattern. You just specify which part of your simulation transmits spikes. And on another node, you can just simply say where you want to receive those spikes. Um, patch offers many more syntactical sugar and convenient methods. Um, and take a look at the at the GitHub. I wrote uh, what I call the candy guide to show you all of the syntactic sugar that it adds and all of the nice features that it can provide. And if you're interested, just take a look if it can um, improve your life uh, in your daily life. The next one I wanted to show you is uh, Glia, which is basically a package manager for a neuron, specifically for its mod files. I noticed that when I was working with uh, neural models that the different versions of mod files uh, kind of stacked up and got littered everywhere in different directions. So Glia provides a way to manage a central library of mod files installed on your computer, which also means that you can specify versions of these packages that you want to see installed. And if authors want to release new versions, other people can quickly switch to these versions. I um, recorded how that works. In, um, in practice. So we're going to install Glia from pip. And upon installation, there shouldn't be many mechanisms available. And we're going to install a Glia package, which provides some mod files. And Glia detects that they've been installed. And now you can see a more expansive list of mechanisms. You can explore those, which variants are available in them so that authors can provide different implementations of the same mechanisms. And as soon as you import the library, all of those are compiled into the background and made available in Neuron. So you don't have to manually compile mod files anymore. And we can then simply insert those mechanisms into sections by using this syntax. I'm going to show you what happens if there are uh, naming conflicts. You get a nice error, you get uh, which variants are available, and you can specify which variant you, you're actually interested in this case. The specifications of which packages or which variants you're interested in can actually be combined in many different ways. You can specify them for the entirety of the script. You can specify global preferences. You can specify preferences within a width block. So it's very flexible and it's very easy to manage the central library this way. Nope, not again. Yeah. And then the last tool I wanted to show is um, Arborize, which allows you to uh, create high level, high level descriptions of cell models. It uh, happens in three easy steps. You specify which files contain your morphologies, like your SWC or ASC files. And you can uh, modify them in um, a pipeline of build functions. For example, if you'd like to your morphology, if you'd like to add or remove certain sections from the morphology files, you can all do that. Then you move on to define section types and synapse types, and you label all of your sections so that certain section and synapse types get applied to them. In code, it looks like this. This is a basket cell model. We define the soma, dendrites, and axon synapse section types. We specify which mechanisms we'd like to see inserted in them, and then we specify attributes. I've collapsed those because there's quite a lot of uh, parameters you need to set on all of these mechanisms. 
But then in the background, just by specifying these types, Arborize will make sure that every section that is part of the SOMA or every section that is a dendrite gets all of these mechanisms inserted and the attributes are set correctly. There's also a little bit of syntax to uh, apply special labels, for example, to make distal or proximal dendrites or to make an action in distal segment. You can do that currently based on the diameter of sections or based on their ID. And um, when that's done, you actually already have a function on uh, neuron models. So the code below the image here shows how to initialize it. You can just uh, tell it you want to record the SOMA, you run your simulation, and you're ready to plot the results like this. That uh, were my um, Python tools for uh, Neuron. If there are any questions, uh, let me know. All right. Thank you very much, Robin. Can you hear me? Yep. Yes. OK, we don't have the same issue again. Um, right, so I have a question. So you've worked with Neuron a lot, and you're trying to develop tools to make it easier to use. Um, so for anyone just starting their PhD off, uh, what is the most important advice that you can offer to save some grief or time when using Neuron or anything in this space? Well, <laughs> the first advice would be to use my tools, of course. <laughs> um, it's worth exploring the documentation, even though it's, it's not the most... Um, straightforward documentation. Their forums contain a lot of uh, advice, but it's also a time-consuming process to look through it. And I'd say incrementally build your model. Don't try to program it all at once, just small steps. Check if a synapse works, check if the sections are connected together well. And, uh, don't bite off more than you can chew because it's a very punishing language at the start. Okay, that's that's unsensible in most uh, <laughs> scientific jobs. You start off small, validate, build larger, validate, build even larger, validate. Yeah. Okay, uh, that sounds very sensible. Um, we have a question. If I could possibly navigate this uh, uh, interface, so Carmen Lupashku asks, or well, begins by saying, "Thank you, Robin, for your presentation." Uh, with the second module, you mentioned something about the need to not recompile when a new mod file is added. Is that right? The mechanism yes. can be added after without the need to recompile? Yes, yes. So um, what Glia does is it um, every pip package that gets installed can declare that it has components available for Glia. So if you install a newer version of that package, Glia will check whether anything changed in that in those definitions, and if that happens, it'll recompile uh, the mod file library. So it detects changes and then recompiles, but it won't recompile if there's no changes. Great. Okay, so since there are no questions right now, um, I'm sure they're they're gonna more are gonna come up by the end of the session. So uh, thank you, Robin. Uh, we're going to have extra questions for you in like 10 minutes. Okay. Um, now we could uh, move on to Maria Luisa and her presentation. Hi. Okay, I'm sharing. Um... Okay, can you see? Yes, everything seems good, okay. and we can also hear you. Okay, perfect. Uh, good afternoon to everybody. I'm uh, Maria Luisa, and I'm a postdoc. I'm working uh, in the Gideon Angelos lab. And in this presentation, I will tell you about uh, my research project that concerns the study of the cerebellar granular layer activity. Okay, okay. So in this layer, uh, the incoming inputs are carried out are carried by mossy fibers that uh, carried excitatory inputs to granule and Golgi cells. Golgi cells are inhibitory neurons that inhibit granule cells activity that in turn excite Golgi cells activity. 
So there is a feedback and feedforward inhibitor loop that regulates the activity in the granular layer. And to study the circuit activity, we need to detect signals from multiple points in the sample. And we acquired, uh, we record the dynamic process that require high throughput parallel acquisition of signals that uh, are rapidly time varying. Uh, for this purpose, optical techniques are very useful, and uh, among these, two photon microscopy in particular allow to obtain localized excitation in the sample and to acquire uh, with a high signal to noise ratio. Use we can acquire images with a submicrometer resolution. Uh, also, we split the laser beam in order to obtain uh, simultaneous to obtain multiple beamlets that uh, simultaneously excite uh, multiple sem multiple sites in the sample. Uh, just to study the granular layer activity, we developed in our lab a um, particular kind of two-photon microscope, the spatial light modulator two-photon microscope that uses uh, the device, uh, the spatial light modulator, in order to split the laser beam that comes from a femtosecond pulse laser. So uh, the SLM splits the incoming laser beam into multiple beamlets that are then directed onto the sample, where they elicit fluorescence that is collected by a CCD or a CMOS camera. And in this way, we are able to simultaneously excite and record from multiple sites while maintaining the single cell resolution. Uh, so we use the system to study the granular layer activity from acute cerebellar crisis, bulk loaded with FURA QIM, that is a dye that uh, binds with uh, calcium ions. So we can uh, record uh, the neuronal activity by recording uh, calcium changes that are translated in changes in fluorescent signals. In this slide, I will show you how uh, an experiment is carried out. So first of all, we start with the acquisition of a high spatial resolution image of the sample. And for this purpose, the um, SLM is programmed in order to split the laser beam into multiple beamlets that are these bright dots. Uh, each beamlet moves uh, in a raster scan way and cover a little area on the sample where it elicits fluorescence. Fluorescence is then collected by the CCD camera and the software. Uh, meanwhile, they construct the corresponding image like this one on the right. Once the image is collected, we can uh, start with the acquisition. Uh, we can select uh, which uh, cells we want to monitor, and we then program the SLM in order to uh, direct the different beamlets onto different cells. And we obtain a multi-spot illumination pattern like this one on the right, in which every bright dot, again, uh, was a beamlet that was directed onto a different cell. And we can then start to record, to acquire the ground cells uh, signals, uh, that are elicited by an electrical stimulation of the MOSI fiber bundle. This is an example of an acquisition. Um, we can see that uh, when we stimulate the MOSI fiber bundle, we observe um, fluorescence variation in different cells. So. And here we can, uh, you can see an example of multiple traces acquired simultaneously. Uh, in particular, FURA2 uh, decreases its fluorescence uh, signals when intracellular calcium concentration increases. So we use the system. Um, okay. Okay. We use this system to study the spatial organization of the granular layer activity. And uh, we perform calcium imaging experiments uh, before and after the perfusion of gabazine that blocks the uh, Golgi cells activity. Uh, these are activity maps that show on a color scale both the number and the intensity of granular cell responses. Uh, you can see that uh, during the perfusion, during the gabazine perfusion, both the number of granular cells that show an activity and the intensity of this activity increases. Uh, to better visualize the spatial organization, uh, we average together uh, different experiments and we obtain a cumulative excitatory inhibitory balance map like this one that show that the granular cells, the granular layer activity is organized in center surrounding units with uh, uh, a core that, uh, in which excitation prevails uh, with the uh, inhibitory regions that surround uh, the core. Also, 
Uh, we used the system to study the spatial organization of long-term plasticity that was induced uh, through a high-frequency stimulation of the MOSI fiber bundle with a protocol known to induce long-term plasticity at the MOSI fiber granule cell synapses. Uh, we performed these experiments both in control condition and with the perfusion of gabapentin during the whole experiment. Again, we averaged together different experiments to obtain uh, cumulative plasticity maps, as this one show here. Uh, we can observe that in control condition, uh, the there is a core of prevailing potentiation and there are uh, different regions of inhibition that surround it. While during the gabazine perfusion, uh, the, there is a remarkable increase of areas showing potentiation with a uh, fewer region of inhibition. So this shows that uh, the role of Golgi cells in regulating the activity in the granular layer and also the expression of plasticity in the granular layer and its spatial organization. Then we use this data to validate a realistic model of the granular layer that was developed in our lab with Python neurons. And uh, here I show you some uh, results from the model that uh, were in good agreement with experimental results, uh, both uh, uh, regarding the excitatory inhibitory balance uh, obtained uh, with the model and uh, the uh, long-term plasticity expression uh, in both the conditions studied, so with inhibition on and inhibition off. Uh, use, uh, we can use the model to predict other properties of the granular layer. And uh, here I show an example of these results. Uh, the model predicted that the granular layer can act as a filter of the incoming input and that uh, after plasticity induction, these uh, filtering properties can change. Uh, and for example, here we can see that there is an announcement out of low frequency transmission. Uh, Due uh, plasticity can create spatial filter channels that regulate both the spike delay and the gain of the spike retransmission at the cerebellar input stage. Also, these changes can have an impact uh, on the subsequent computation of the, in the molecular layer, as well as in the Purkinje cells output. Uh, if you are interested in this project, you can read the article that you can find at this link, and also uh, you can ask me. So thank you for your attention, and uh, please, uh, for more questions, contact me. Thank you very much, uh, Maria Luisa. There was a wonderful talk showing all of all of the good things that we want to see in models predicting what would happen in experiments and then experiments validating what the models uh, said should happen so that's lovely um okay then i have a question since no one else has uh, asked one just yet um so in in your abstract you you said that granular layer activity is organized in centers around units and obviously you, you showed that to us uh, here, um, and that that are well suited to support dense cluster computation. Could you uh, give us a bit more insight on in what it means? Um, what what is a dense cluster computation? What and why is it useful? So we observed that uh, yeah, uh, also in different uh, orientation of the slices. Uh, also from experimental point of view, and also these were reproduced by the model, uh, yeah, there was uh, always a core of uh, excitation that responded, I would say, better, and then uh, other areas around it uh, that um, show inhibition. So there is a modulation in uh, the way in which uh, the incoming patterns, incoming stimuli are retransmitted. And also, this uh, could happen in different parts of the same slice, in different points. So this creates some, I would say, channels of uh, transmission. Awesome. Okay, thank you. Um, if there are no specific questions for Maria Luisa at this moment, I will open up the floor. Um, we have quite a bit of time, uh, I think. To, to open up the floor for some questions for either Maria Luisa or Robin, uh, if people want to ask any, including raising your hand, and you can ask it live.
So um, I guess I'll, I'll ask an extra question, uh, Robin. Um, I know this is a hard question to to ask, and I'm I'm sorry to have to ask it. Um, what what is the the state of sort of documentation and testing for the libraries that you've set up? I mean that you are you are clear, ah. you are clearly a PhD student trying to do your own research, and you're trying this. That's the goal of the software to do your research, not the software itself. Peter, I have um, a code coverage of ninety nine point sixty six percent on patch. Okay, that's ideal. If that, that that should speak volumes just by itself. Yeah. A, if if the main goal of the software is to fix bugs and to make things easier and to guarantee like a smooth smooth sailing, then continuous integration and testing are key to that. Yeah. Uh, I can't say the same about uh, Glia, for example, but I think still it's like 85%. Uh, but they all have documentation, they all have testing, um, they all have code coverage, yeah. Then then it sounds, it sounds like a wonderful utopia. Could I also ask how many users do you have? How many? Users. Uh, well. I created them um, for internal use, actually, and this is the very first time that I've presented them anywhere. Okay. So um, I'm not sure if I have any users yet, actually. Would be nice to see that number grow, of course, and to see people opening issues and to see people explore what they can do with it. It'd be wonderful. I think Glia can really help people that aren't very interested in, in managing all of their mod files. And I think Patch can help people write more fluent and uh, beautiful code. That sounds awesome. Sounds like you're you know, offering a great service to to humanity by, by making sure <laughs> all of the tools to do research are, I don't know, maintained properly and functional. So yeah, okay. Um, we have a question uh, from Carmen again. Um, so nice presentation, Maria Luisa. When you analyze the activity of the neurons, you mostly mediated the activity over many simulations. How many uh, simulations are you running? And um, I saw a big standard deviation in the traces. How does, how does this affect your analysis? You're, you're muted. Sorry. So yeah, um, so I ever gather different experiments, um, I would say at least five slides uh, for each um, type of experiment, five or more. And uh, we did uh, the same with the model by simulating different area of the network. And so, yeah, there are the cumulative maps that I show are uh, average of these different results. So these are uh, the origin of the standard deviation that are indicated. Okay. Um, maybe which which exactly traces? Maybe I can ask that. Um, it would be the, the easiest way would be Carmen, you probably don't want to do this, but maybe you do. Would you like to raise your hand so you can ask the follow up a follow up question or just say whether you're you're happy? Okay. She can. <laughs> okay, maybe you can write me. <laughs> It's 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 I guess uh, a bit harder now that you don't have the slides in front of you, so you could uh, easily just jump to the one that we're looking for. But that's okay. Um, okay. So thank you. Um, I don't see any other questions. Uh, in this case, I will begin the the final. Um, bit of, of the, the seminar session, um, which is the closing remarks. Um, so thank you very much again for uh, to everyone for coming to the, the fifth HPPTN slides. Um, this is going to be the final session of the summer 
uh, we're going to go on a summer vacation in our own apartments, of course, it's we can't go outside very far, uh, but we'll be back in September. Um, if uh, young researchers from the HPP, uh, master students or uh, PhD students or postdocs would like to present their research during a, a future HPP TN slide session, please get in touch um, via the HPP education program email, which should be in front of us right now. Um, please do submit your expression of interest during this break, uh, as this will help us better plan the sessions in the fall. Um, further, sort of after the, the webinar, after you close this, this um, window, a browser window will pop up with the surveys. If you'd like to help us improve future sessions, please do leave some feedback. Um, what you thought went well and didn't go very well um, with the session. Um, and I think that's it. Stay safe and sane out there and uh, see you at the next one in September uh, at the date to be announced. Thank you very much. Thank you.